Well, thank you, Lou. And um, I just have to say that um, um, I'm thrilled and, and humbled by Madeline's and Lou's remarks um, and feel as if I'm an unlikely recipient uh, for this distinction. But I will say that in my seven years uh, as a museum director, after 30 years as a museum curator, I have undergone um, a deep transformation in the way I, I look at museums and think about the world. It's been an extraordinary opportunity for me to learn and, and open up my mind to, to new horizons. And um, while I previously was a proponent of curatorial integrity, I helped found the Association of Art Museum Curators 15 years ago, uh, which was the first professional organization for art museum curators in, in our country. Um, so I, I believe strongly in curatorial practice, but I don't believe in curatorial infallibility. And I have come to recognize, as I work with my extraordinarily talented curators uh, at the Houston Museum, um, that all of us need editors, you know, and we all need help. Uh, there's a fantastic film out about Toni Morrison, and she talks about being an editor while she worked at Random House and writing those books that won her a Nobel Prize. And she also spoke uh, about how she needed an editor. Um, and so um, I need an editor, we all need editors. Uh, we all need help to constantly improve um, our practice. So I'm, I'm deeply grateful for this distinction. I, I feel rather unworthy, but I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what we've been doing at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and, and, and first and foremost, who we are, because not all of you will have been. So we were, we say we were founded in 1900 by the uh, Ladies Art League of Houston, who uh, wanted to bring art reproductions into um, public schools, so a noble, a noble ambition. In 1914, our institution, our organization, received a plot of land as part of a city expansion, a city beautiful expansion. And in 1924, we opened the doors to our first uh, building, typically neoclassic. That's, that's what you would expect in an American city at that time. We were a very small burb at that time, 50,000 people in 1900. But the city of Houston has doubled every 10 years and continued to do so until 2010. Uh, and so now we're rivaling Chicago in terms of an incorporated city. We're, we're the fourth largest city. We, we think sometimes we might overtake Chicago. So you guys have to go home and reproduce so to, <laughs> to make sure that um, you stay on top. Um, so our 1924 building has our non-Western art in it, African art. And we have the largest collection of pre-Columbian gold in North America. Uh, pre, uh, as well as the only collection of African gold of any distinction, Indonesian gold, Indian art, Korean art, Japanese art, uh, uh, these all have dedicated galleries, although they're small collections and they're just burgeoning. It's also where we exhibit Islamic art uh, for now. Um, and I just want, uh, yeah. And it was extended in 1958 and 1974 by Mies van der Rohe, Chicago architect. Uh, and it was his first uh, proper museum building, and lo you know, long before the one that's more famous in, in Berlin. Um, in 2000, we opened our Rafael Moneo uh, building. Uh, Rafael Moneo had worked on the Tissa Museum and at, at, and at the Prado in, in Madrid. He was head of Graduate School of Design uh, at Harvard University, and this is a beautiful building, and it's where we have our Western art from antiquity through early 20th century. We also have two house museums, uh, Bayou Bend for American decorative arts and Rienzi for European decorative arts. And these were left to the, given to the museum, actually lifetime gifts by both uh, donors, reflecting their own interests and tastes. They, both houses are by a distinguished Houston architect, one of his very first, Bayou Bend, and one of his very last, uh, Rienzi. And uh, here's who we are. And then last year, these are our most recent numbers. Our fiscal year ended June 30th. And, um, and, and, and last year was an exceptional year. And that's in part to, thanks to the Dolores Cole Foundation. We had one, you know, 1.25 million visitors. We'll, we won't be able to do that next year. This year, we'll probably back to 
a little more than a million, which is our normal. And that's because we had a Van Gogh exhibition. And that extra bump, that extra 250,000, is all Van Gogh. Uh, about 100,000 people attending our learning and interpretation or educational programs. We had um, 70, more than 75,000 youth visitors, which means free visitors. Actually, a third of our visitors get in for three. So we, we do charge general, general admission if you're not a member. It's now $17. Uh, but a third of all of our visitors across the campus get in for free one way or another. And every Thursday, which is our longest day, we're open till 9, is a free day. Um, you know, social media is growing. It's not where we want it to be yet. We have 663 permanent staff members and usually around uh, 1,500 volunteers. Audience engagement is absolutely at uh, the core of our identity. It's, it's what we do. And um, looking at diversity is a key component of audience engagement, and it's how we what's one of the important criteria by which we measure our success and impact in the community. And so we're doing pretty well. When I came to the museum um, seven years ago and I was asked to articulate some goals, I, you know, I said that I wanted to increase attendance because I thought that the museum was, had great potential there, uh, and I wanted to increase the diversity of, of our attendance, the diversity of our, of our visitors. And you can see that we're uh, exceeding on the uh, uh, Asian, and by the way, Houston is the most, so statistically, everyone will tell you this, it is the most diverse incorporated city in the country. And, um, and, in, and in many places we have a third, a third, a third, many community parts of the Houston geographic area, um, you know, a third white or Anglo, a third Hispanic, a third African American, um, we have a growing Asian population. And just a, a quick sidebar on how much Houston has changed. I'm a native Houstonian. I graduated from high school in 1972. And when I did, Houston was 68% Anglo or white, 20% African American, 8% Hispanic. Well, when I came back 40 years later to direct the museum, the 68% Anglo was now 34% of the population. The 8% Hispanic had become 43% of the population. And the African Americans remained about the same. Asians, which were unmeasurable when I graduated high school, are now 8% of the population. So you see what the big change has occurred in, in places like Texas and especially Houston. Um, and you see how our demographics uh, hew close to that. We're, uh, we're still not up to where we want to be in terms of Hispanic uh, visitorship, um, but I would say that in part, if you ex exclude sort of ethnic identity or language and simply look at who are likely to be museum visitors in terms of their age and educational attainment, uh, our Hispanic population, which in Houston is almost entirely or by a very large percentage, first-generation immigrants, people who have come themselves uh, and are working one or two jobs and raising their families. And I think that the average age of our Hispanic community is something like 29. So they're not going to have time to be museum visitors. Uh, and, and typically, museum visitors are older and people with, with, with um, a higher education than some of our uh, recent Hispanic immigrants, um, and certainly with time on their hands. Uh, so we have work to do with, um, with our Hispanic uh, numbers, uh, but we are working very hard to address our his Hispanic audiences, and you'll see that in a second. Uh, we are, like many museums in the country, uh, largely a female audience, 61%, male only 36%. <laughs> I'm not sure about that discrepancy. Uh, we do, now, when we take our overall attendance, which includes our mixers for young people, et cetera, then 92% of our guests are under 45 years old. But Houston is a young city, so younger than a place like New York City, uh, for example, or, or, or Los Angeles. And so our, our demographics um, hew a little younger. Um, and we overall still get a very strong representation from the Hispanic uh, community. Uh, social media is growing, uh, but we're not where, where we'd like to be. Uh, one way that we've uh, 
made an impact in terms of diversifying our audience has been with a tradition now, we're in our seventh year, of summer immersive exhibitions. And we inaugurated that in 2013 with a James Terrell retrospective, which was part of a three-part three show, one in Los Angeles, one at the Guggenheim in New York, and one at the Houston Museum. And this opened up the museum uh, to people who felt, who understood they didn't need to have any prior education in order to be immersed in one of Terrell's extraordinary environments. We followed that with uh, the very last work by Soto, uh, an extraordinary artist who, this was his last commission. He died before it was actually completed. It's called a Penetrable, and uh, we had a great number of visitors uh, who joyfully explored these hanging uh, polyvinyl uh, threads. Uh, Philip Worthington, um, uh, made for us a version of the shadow monsters that he had previewed at uh, Museum of Modern Art, which is where you interact with a camera and you know, create shadows, like you know, the rabbit, the bunny, et cetera, uh, that we did when we were children. But the computer program transformed whatever you were doing with your body or your, or your hands into monsters that were belching and burping and uh, making rude sounds. Uh, we had a Kusama retrospective, uh, well, we had a Kusama exhibition one summer that was extremely popular, again, very diverse audience, and Pipilotti Rist uh, the following year. Looks like it's the same, it was a completely different experience, and uh, one of our most popular exhibitions. Big Bamboo, previous summer, I was a lucky fellow who had commissioned the Starn Brothers to do the first iteration of Big Bamboo on the roof of the Metropolitan Museum in 2007, and they came back and, and did this one for us. Uh, and then uh, William Forsyth was this summer's immersive exhibition, a, a, a well-known choreographer who, uh, who made this um, very uh, interesting dis exhibition uh, where you walk through a set of pendulums that were uh, motorized by computer, and in doing that, you had to change your body posture and in a sense become a dancer, become aware of yourself and your movement and, your, and how you occupy space. Uh, we're an, an encyclopedic museum and we have a typical array uh, of programs. And so just to show you apart from these immersive exhibitions, we also try to address different audiences. So we had a marvelous Rubens exhibition uh, of tap great tapestries that were made for a, a Spanish convent. And, and here we address specifically the Spanish Catholic population of Houston with these extraordinary uh, tapestries. We also wanted to get some first time visitors uh, and everyone, Houston is a car culture Everybody has to have a car. It's very difficult to exist in Houston, to work in Houston without a car. We have uh, a small mass transit system. Um, and so uh, Sculpted in Steel, which were true works of art. This was a limited period, 1929, 1939, in cars that were extraordinary in terms of their design impact. So this was not about engineering. This was about sheer beauty. And it was like seeing a jewelry exhibition, but big jewelry that could actually take you around. Um, we have, you know, traditional European art exhibitions like the Degas exhibition that we um, organized um, with, the art, um, with Australia uh, two years ago. It was one of our most successful European art exhibitions. We had a fashion exhibition, Oscar de la Renta, which was, in a way was a typical blockbuster, beautiful show. He had always been very popular among Houston ladies. Uh, we uh, take opportunities when we learn that one of the largest drawings surviving by Michelangelo, over six feet tall, was coming to New York from Naples for uh, the big Michelangelo retro, uh, drawings exhibition that the Met held last year. Uh, we were able to bring it to Houston and create our own exhibition about Michelangelo's relationship with the Farnese Pope and all the great work they'd done together, including the Dome of St. Peter's, the Pauline Chapel, the completion of the Sistine Chapel, etc. Typical work that we do, and very, very proud of this, is uh, borrow an exhibition like Icons of Style, which had been um, created by the Getty Museum to, um, uh, to, to bring in the icons of fashion photography uh, by Richard Avedon or Irving Penn and all the great photographers who worked for Harper's Bazaar, Bazaar and Vogue. But when we were looking at the list and thinking about the installation, we realized that 
there were very few photographers of color and even fewer models of color represented in that exhibition. That, of course, was a reflection of fashion photography in the fashion industry in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, and so we diversified the exhibition, and we included a third new photographs specifically of models of color or photographers of color. And uh, I'm just delighted with the result. We, we took something that, we, that everyone would consider familiar and gave them something new and fresh. But the reason I'm here today is because of our Van Gogh exhibition. And this was uh, a result of a collaboration with the Kroller Mueller Museum in Otterlo, uh, the Netherlands, and the, the Vincent Van Gogh Museum. Uh, where I actually am a member of a supervisory board. I've been working with them for, I think, five years now. And uh, they uh, agreed to collaborate with us on a Van Gogh exhibition. It's every museum director's dream, and it did everything and more than we expected uh, it would, uh, a record-breaking you know, quarter of a million visitors. We were anticipating 100,000 visitors, and we had our fingers crossed. And, uh, and our friends in Holland kept on saying, you're, at, you know, you're crazy, you're out of your mind, it's gonna be double that, you just wait and see. And, and indeed it was. But as an important component of that exhibition, uh, we, uh, we, had, we, we had been approached by the Dolores Cole Foundation about their uh, Van Gogh Up Close, um, our Van Gogh in This World uh, exhibition, and this was an extraordinary component to the exhibition. We had it as, you, you came into our Van Gogh exhibition, you saw the original works of art, you left, and then you walked into the separate room, a separate world where you could sit on Van Gogh's, in his bedroom, a bit like you saw in Chicago here a couple of years ago at their exhibition. You could be part of the night cafe, you could manipulate Starry Night uh, on a computer screen, uh, you could see an extraordinary and lifelike uh, recreation of the artist's studio with paint and a croissant. I kept on touching that croissant. It's made out of rubber, but it certainly looked real. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure. <laughs> I bet Vincent Van Gogh's croissants were rubbery too. Um, uh, and. The interesting thing about this is we didn't have quite as many visitors. We had 177,000 visitors to Dolores Cole Foundation's um, uh, exhibition uh, versus the quarter of a million uh, in the main exhibition, but the majority were adults. So you would think that this is predicated on children, but in fact, adults loved it. And they found it another way to engage with Vincent's art. Vincent, uh, Vincent is a brand like no other. He is an artist who has familiarity around the world on all the continents. Um, and it's very difficult to come up with other artists you know, for whom a similar um, educational component would be as effective. Perhaps Munch, Edvard Munch, is, 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 an, is another obvious example. We're about to have a Francis Bacon exhibition uh, uh, in the spring, and I'm trying to think what are the learnings from this Van Gogh exhibition that we could incorporate in making the Francis Bacon exhibition um, more accessible to people who are not familiar with his art? Another way that we help diversify our audiences is through talking to influencers. And there's this marvelous Nigerian-born Houstonian named Toby Nwigwe, uh, who is a famous rapper, and he does great music videos. And I think I may, and he's come to our museum to actually record his videos. He loves the museum. And um, there they are in our house museum. I don't know if this one actually plays. It seems not to be. I think it's just a still. Diversity initiative. So you've, you've, you've heard about how the Hispanic audience has, or Hispanic population of Houston has grown dramatically, uh, dramatically in the last uh, 40 years. We have one of the most important Latin American art initiatives in the country. Uh, we have an extraordinary curator named Mary Carmen Ramirez and an associate curator named, uh, yes, associate curator named Rachel Mull. We also have the uh, International um, Center for the Arts of Americas, which is a research institution that we house and fund at our institution with a website. And we also have a Latino Art Advisory Council that advises us on how to better reach the Latino community. Um, how to engage with them better and to listen to use, we use this council as a, as a sounding board and, and we, we learn from them. 
Some of the programs we had just uh, last year was uh, the only exhibition of Cuban revolutionary art to be held in our country since 1959, and it almost was scuttled when uh, the occupant of the White House changed a couple of years ago. Um, a marvelous exhibition of Mexico modernism, and these were three exhibitions in a row, and an exhibition called Home about Latin American identity. Uh, and those were very successful exhibitions, a lot of visitors. But the interesting thing is if we take, we, and we do zip code analysis in order to understand the likely ethnicity or, or identification of our visitors, and when we add up the likely number of Hispanic visitors to those three Latino-themed exhibitions, we had many more Latinos come to our Van Gogh exhibition than they did about you know, Latino culture. And so you might say, Latinos don't need to see an exhibition about Latino identity. They know what their identity is. This is for the gringos. And, uh, and I perfectly <laughs> accept that uh, as, as a proposition. But it also shows that we shouldn't be typecasting people. We shouldn't be boxing them into corner. and ours, uh, corners. And our Latino advisory committee said, you know, advertise in the Spanish newspaper, go onto Spanish TV, and promote Van Gogh because your Hispanic audience is going to want to see this exhibition. And indeed, we had a big spike in Hispanic attendance to Van Gogh, much more so than Degas, for example. But that's not the only community in Houston. And so we've been making specific outreach to the Asian community, Asian communities, and many communities there are, with a Korean exhibition, uh, with a Japanese exhibition with a Chinese exhibition from Taipei. And for each of these exhibitions and projects, we have a steering committee of community leaders that help us engage with the community, with the Indian community. We have 150,000 Indian Americans uh, in Houston. And one of the biggest initiatives of which I'm most proud since I've been there is the Islamic Initiative. When I got there, we had a couple of dozen works uh, representing Islamic culture. The Houston Museum, we now have over 1,300 uh, either in the collection or on long-term, meaning 20, 30-year loan to uh, the institution. And so we have great partnerships. We're generating exhibitions, making scholarly publications. Very, very proud of that. And, um, and one of the exhibitions we had is this one uh, specializing uh, or focusing on Iranian art. Um, we have an African-American advisory council. This is something that existed long before I arrived. I think it's almost 30 years uh, in existence, but they are, have new en renewed energy. We have uh, a new African-American curator. We don't have a separate department of African-American art, uh, but so our curator, Kenitra Fletcher, works within the modern and contemporary department. Uh, but she's deeply involved with the community. Uh, she's a Houstonian as, as well. And uh, we have many projects underway, including Soul of a Nation, which is opening in the spring at our institution. Uh, I also want to say, I don't have a slide for it, is that um, I also am proud to say that out of the 70,000 objects we have at the museum, and talking about diversity, uh, I acquired the first piece of Judaica for the museum. So 70,000 objects, the museum's more than 100 years old, and we bought our first piece of Jewish art, a uh, 14th century prayer book, large, bigger than this podium, um, for a synagogue, uh, showing uh, beautiful illustrations and calligraphy. Uh, it's called um, a machsor, uh, which is the festival prayer book that's brought out on the, all the high holidays. Um, so, you know, we talk about diversity, but Judaica is an element of European art or Middle Eastern art that is often ignored by uh, so-called encyclopedic uh, museums. So this year, more than 1.2 million visitors. Uh, just a little bit on our, um, on our finances. We have a, actually this is old, we now have a $70 million uh, budget. Half of it comes from the endowment. A quarter comes from fundraising. A quarter comes from earned income. We have happily a $1.3 billion endowment and no debt. And the no debt part is an important part of our museum finances. And um, we're in, currently engaged in a, a big expansion. So when I got here, the three buildings in brown were there, but uh, buildings one, plaza two, building four, and building eight uh, were not. So I built three buildings in a huge plaza and we're about to open uh, the fourth. Uh, all this is thanks to extraordinary generosity on the part of our 
board of trustees. So we made a new building for our Glassell School, which is more than 50 years old, designed by Stephen Hall, a new plaza. See our, our Anish Kapoor. This is our new building for modern and contemporary art, which will open a year from now. There's a live picture of the roof. And we opened a center for conservation, top of an existing garage, one of the most commodious in the country, and we built a 65,000 square foot uh, um, storage facility just outside of town. It's already full. <laughs> Uh, and we did that with um, a capital campaign of $450 million, and we're currently at 469 in terms of funds raised. So mission accomplished, although we are, we're not there yet, we would like to raise up to $485 million to, to give a, an extra boost to, to our endowment. So that's in a quick synopsis of what we do and who we are. Thank you very much. Welcome to Chicago. Thanks very much. So um, I want to dive in on some of the terms that are used so frequently these days. Diversity, inclusion, racial equity is really the term du jour that gets used a lot. And often they, they are used in place of each other mm -hmm. um, as opposed to recognizing the difference. Yeah. So if we assume that diversity is representation and inclusion is feeling welcome, and Equity is the theme of CHF, it's power. Um, how are you, a lot of what you talked about was the diversity, uh, certainly a lot of inclusion in terms of the councils. What does equity look like at MFAH? What does shifting power and resources look like? Yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a sim simple elevator answer uh, to that question. Um, I think it, I mean, I don't know what you mean by equity. Um, all I can say is uh, I have worked hard to not only diversify our audience, but to diversify our staff. So when I sit down every two weeks for my senior management um, meeting, two hours on Thursdays, uh, and look at the room of 20 senior managers with among my 663, I see every race, race ethnicity, and religion. Um, you know, East Asians, South Asians, Central Asians, Africans, Europeans, Latin Americans, um, who come from all kinds of backgrounds and practice all sorts of uh, religion uh, and, and faith. So that is, that is one way of, if you might call it, spreading power, by having people of different backgrounds and formations and ideas and experiences contribute to the conversation that creates policy. Uh, similarly, and we're very much a staff-run organization. Um, and, but I have, so our board of trustees doesn't specify policy, doesn't dictate to us. Uh, we propose and they dispose. Uh, we propose programs and, and they help fund them. Um, but I've worked very hard to diversify our board of trustees, which is 66% female. Um, and again, every race, race and ethnicity and religion is, is represented uh, in it. And I think that you know, we're often these questions are posed um, in terms of race, and often the race is considered to be you know, African American versus Anglo or white American. But in a place like Texas, you know, we have all sorts of nuances on that, um, uh, on that issue. And so having proper representation of Muslims and Hindus and Latin Americans of, you know, and among the Latin Americans, there's all, there's all sorts of Latin Americans who come in all kinds of um, different identifications. Uh, so we strive for diversity among our board of trustees. We're constantly self-renewing um, and the room of trustees looks different now, seven years later, than it did when I arrived. So let's stay on Texas 
and Houston in particular, which is such an interesting city. You shared some of the statistics. It's the fourth largest city, mm -hmm. um, probably will surpass Chicago because we are losing population. Mm -hmm. um, we reproduce better. <laughs> it's warmer down there. <laughs> um, but good air conditioning. <laughs> we talk about um, Chicago also in terms of what are the rising issues that we want to um, confront. And so um, I, I think some of the most interesting things about the MCA Chicago is that it's based in Chicago, just like the MFA. What would make it so interesting is that it's Houston roots. Mm -hmm. um, in Chicago, we might talk about some of the rising issues around protecting immigrants in a sanctuary city. Uh, cannabis is being legalized, and so what's the economic equity play there? Um, we just finished a strike with CTU, so what does education look like? What are, the, what are the pressing issues in Houston? And then how does a museum think about that through its programming or its collection, or, or do you? Uh, we do and we don't. I mean, we're, we can't, you know, we're all, everyone, all 663 of us are living in, in, in our society, and we all are engaging with um, community members, and we all bring those experiences back to, to the workplace. Um, as a museum, we don't have, you know, we don't, we don't have a position on the legalization of, of cannabis, um, and um, and I don't know really what to say is that except that, uh, you know, our museum is in society and it serves society, and the motto on our museum, which was carved in 1924 on the on the lintel, is a place for all people. Of course, that meant something different in 1924 than it does today. And those, you know, 100,000 Houstonians look differently in 1924 than the 4.5 million Harris County residents look like uh, today. So what that all people is, and in the South, where we had Jim Crow laws, and where African Americans were not welcome at our museum until the 50s, um, I don't know when our first African-American trustee or staff member arrived uh, at the museum, probably not until the 70s, let's say. Um, so, and uh, when our first Hispanic member arrived, our first Muslim member, our first Central Asian, you know, all this is part of uh, a, changing, a changing society. So I feel that it's very important that for the museum to succeed, that it represent its community and that it give back to the community opportunities that that community finds stimulating and wants, and, and wants to enjoy. And I also see ourselves as fundamentally an educational institution, not, not just a place of higher learning where experts, art historians, create new knowledge through research uh, by study of the works of art that we have in our collections, but as an educational institution for everyone who walks in walks in our doors. So first we have to make sure that people feel comfortable walking in our doors. Then we have to make sure that they can understand what it is that we're trying to communicate and that we're able to communicate in a language that they understand and even with a vocabulary that's meaning, uh, meaningful to them. As an educational institution, I know I'm sort of wandering around that, but I hope I'll get in the end to your question, uh, is that education in Houston, like it is in almost every large city in the country, is a huge question, issue, topic, problem. Um, and what I see in the city of Houston is something having grown up there and having gone to public school. Uh, my school, Bel Air High School, was called the Nutrier of the South, so I know about Nutrier and, and your great high school here. Um, and we were very proud of our public school system and the, and the education, I think, 92% of my graduating class of 1,200 students in my class went to a four-year college, and many of us went to Ivy League or prestigious schools. Um, since then, uh, there has been a proliferation of private schools. Every church, synagogue, and you know, mosque and temple has a has a private school now, and um, and the population, the student population of the Houston Independent School District, one of the largest in the country, has tr changed tr dramatically. It's starved for resources. It's got a very contentious um, board of trustees who are elected. 
and um, and I see I see public education as a tremendous problem to be solved by by our country and our society. And I'd like to participate in that in any way I can. So we have these school programs where we both educate educators and we provide opportunities for school children. Um, so you talked a little bit about your journey from being a curator for 30 years to now the last seven years being a museum director. Um, and the Met, you, I read an article where you, when you first got to, uh, in Houston, they put up a sign that said ATM because you kept saying, at the Met, at the Met. Yeah, at the, at the Met. Met we do this and at the <laughs> Met we do that. No, I put a sign on my door when I learned that m my, my colleagues were calling me ATM because ATM. A, at the Met. Yeah. I put a sign on my door that said, ATM inside. Yes. Um, and, and yet, with all due respect to the Met, it isn't really known as a community-centric, egalitarian uh, space. And where you are now really is sort of a beacon for that type of work. So have you changed or your views changed going from a curator to a museum director or going from New York to Houston? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, so yes, change has been exhilarating. And um, I was a curator who was always interested in, and I did you know, big impressionist exhibitions and you know, contemporary installations on the roof at the Met and big sort of classical modernist shows. Uh, I was always interested in the audience. I, um, I was very careful in how I wrote my labels. I wanted the, the joy of an excitement of discovery that I had experienced working on these exhibitions to be palpable to our visitors. And I was always interested in interpretation and communicating with that visitor. The, for me, the whole point of the show was the visitor, not just me, not just my colleagues, was the visitor. And, um, and over time, you know, and I got better at it or more conversant with it. It wasn't something that just came fully formed from my brow. Um, so I've always, it's always been there. And now as a museum director and in a different town like Houston, where we don't have as many specialists, we don't have all these huge universities, you know, surrounding, and we have some great schools in Houston. Um, but it's not like the New York region and we don't have as many students or as graduate students or our history professors. So our work is m not so much addressed to a community of peers as it is fundamentally addressed to an audience of repeat visitors. So what's distinctive about our museum is that we're 92% local. There are very few, I think, if, as far as we know from the AAMD of any large civic organization, we have the highest number of local and repeat visitors. So we have almost no out-of-towners. Um, 80, only 8% are outside of Houston. I'm not talking about outside of Texas, outside of Houston. Of course, you have to drive a long time to get outside of Texas, right? Uh, 13 hours if you're heading west. So um, it's a big state. We don't have impulse, impulse visitors who just happen to be in the neighborhood. You have to, you have to decide to come to our museum. Um, and uh, that, that changes how I look at, the, at our programming, fundamentally. You talked about curatorial integrity. Is that the term you used? Um, and uh, often when we talk about curatorial authority or curatorial integrity, we quickly shift to the canon, right? Um, there's been a lot of criticism about, about how the canon is largely white and largely male. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do to shift that? Is it just in the pipeline of people who are making decisions? Is there a larger systemic hack that needs to happen so that um, in the theme of inclusive museums, more folks can see themselves represented? It's a very complicated um, set of questions, I think, you know, set of issues. Um, while we can work hard to bring forth exposure and knowledge about, let's say, women artists in the past who have been ignored. You know, we have a Bert Murray, so, so, you know, people, someone asked me the other day, why don't you do more for women artists? And I said, okay, well, we just opened, you know, just this week, you know, Beatrice Gonzalez ex retrospective. She's an extraordinary Colombian artist, 87 years old. She was at my museum last night receiving an honor. And a, and a Bert Morisot exhibition, the, the, the female impressionist. 
And I just said, you know, we just had those two exhibitions. We had people that erased. We had Ayori Kusama. We're doing a lot of exhibitions. And so, the, and the person said, oh, re oh, really? And I said, yes. I know you came thinking that we don't do it, but we actually are doing it. It's just that people don't pay attention to it. And it becomes a trope that's, that's repeated. So, you know, when I looked at the Baird Moriso exhibition, we, there, it was a great retrospective that, that traveled around the world. We could not be part of it. We made a small exhibition, including works by her in Houston that couldn't be part of that exhibition because we wanted to highlight her achievement as an artist and as a woman. And the exhibition is astounding, and she is an extraordinary artist. And I said to someone last night, you know, she, is, she has given herself a freedom to express that Monet hadn't yet at the same moment, that Manet hadn't yet, that Degas hadn't yet. And I thought, and maybe because she was a woman, she had less to lose. You know, these men were going to have a career and support a family on their art that they had to sell. Someone like Bert Morisot, who had a wealthy family and who married Edward Manet's brother, Eugène, uh, didn't have to worry about making a living with her art. She could do what she wanted to, in a way. And what she did was truly more extraordinary and avant-garde than many of her, her male colleagues. So we have to work hard to show that. One of the works in our Bert Morisot exhibition has the signature Manet on it. Someone had taken Morisot and made it into Manet. Why? To make it more valuable. Well, it's also not incorrect. She was Berthe Morisot, Madame Eugène Manet. Her last name was Manet. So she was both Morisot and Manet, but the Manet was worth more than the Morisot for the same picture, right? So that just tells us something about how the art market work, how, how the world works. But on the other hand, we can't create more artists than there are. There are, are there, and, and for many antiquities, we have no idea who, who made them, of, you know, Pre-Columbian gold. I don't know if it were if it was women making the pre-Columbian gold or men making the the pre-Columbian gold. We have to. There's more knowledge and research necessary uh, to excavate to understand better in order to give to highlight the achievement of of of, of all creative people. I, I want to get some audience questions in here. We have um, just a little bit of time left. And we have folks in the audience who have uh, microphones that can bring them over to you if you do have questions that you want to ask. Um, and I don't know if the house lights are going to come up to make that easier to see. OK, great. We've got your first question right up here to your left. <laughs> Good afternoon. So uh, as a new kind of like merging curator in the performance and visual arts space, I just started a show about uh, Asian Pacific American representation. And one of my producers actually is a uh, native Houstonian. He speaks very highly of your city. And my question is about curation as far as like, as you said, like you want to have these new emerging artists kind of bring more kind of uh, quality to the space, but you also need to generate like traffic within the museum itself by getting more like Van Gogh's and such. So when you develop, like, or at least decide on your exhibitions, at least like your calendar for the year, about what's the percentage that you try to balance between those two? We have a summer immersive exhibition. So that's every summer. And so that's now just a regular part of our program. And people actually you know, look forward to it and anticipate it. Uh, the rest of our programming is partially opportunistic. It has to do with curators' individual schedules and life cycles. Um, availability and it, and it has to do also with uh, the world calendar of exhibitions and what projects are available uh, uh, for travel. Um, you know, it's not, it, it, you can't, it's very difficult to make an exhibition. Even with space, time, and money, you can't just force people to lend you works of art. <laughs> and try as I might. Um, and, you know, we're so proud to be having Soul of a Nation, an exhibition that's coming uh, uh, to, to our museum this spring. Uh, it's going to San Francisco shortly. Uh, we had to fight to be a venue on that exhibition. At a times when an article, you know, the New York Times wrote an article about how this great exhibition, Soul of a Nation, opened at date, and no American museum wanted that exhibition. Well, I had raised my hand. And to get onto the schedule and to be able to be a venue um, does not go without saying. Um, so 
uh, when we talk about you know diversifying our programming and um, and uh, enlarging and deepening the representation of marginalized people, um, it 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 takes a lot of work, and it's and and it's it's an extraordinary work and an illuminating work, but it, it's work nonetheless. It, you can't just snap your fingers and make it happen overnight. We have a question here in the center. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the fact that you um, have diversified your attendance and board and everything else to the degree that you have, but there's one group that I noticed that doesn't seem to be represented, and that's American Indians, and I'm talking about the ones from America, yeah. not the ones from Southeast Asia. Right. Um, and I'm just wondering, do you include those in your demographic? Numbers, um, do you have any American Indian artists represented, of which there are a fantastic number? Um, is that an area that you think you might expand, or? Yeah, we don't have, uh, we don't have, uh, we don't have a curator with an expertise uh, in uh, Native, okay, I see a volunteer, and, and North American, if that's what you mean, Native American. Um, uh, or indigenous uh, people, we do have uh, extraordinary objects which we display and which we're going to be displaying differently in our campus reorganization after next year. We have great membrane pottery, for example, from the members people who, you know, it, it's thought that the Pueblo uh, people are the successors to the members um, who seem to have disappeared or. Um, I don't really know what, what caused their disappearance of that society, but they left these extraordinary uh, ceramics. We have great Zuni um, craftsmen represented, both drawings and, um, and jewelry. Uh, we have a large collection of Kachina dolls. Uh, we have other Native American pottery, both modern, late 20th century, early 20th century, 19th century, and then we have antiquities. Um, but it isn't... And we do, from time to time, acquire both by gift and, and purchase objects, but we don't have um, a sufficiently strong program. And in terms of uh, representation in the audience, we do, when we have surveys and ask people, but of course it's a sentence of a question, people often you know, refuse to participate, they don't want to be categorized, they don't want to check a box. But Native American is one of the categories uh, on the, the various polls that we have to identify who our audience is. And it's a small number, like 2%. We have time for one more question. It's all the way in the back. Please watch me sprint up there. Well, I grew up in Chicago, moved to Houston in the 70s, and watched the museum grow. And I came before the Mies van der Rohe. And what I liked so much in Houston is it is very inclusive. It always was. And in the art community, there was rapport between the board, between the artists, between the dealers, because it was so small. And watching the various directors improve upon each other rather than swing to the left or to the right has given the museum a place in the community where we all would meet. And if you wanted to meet artists, you knew to go to the museum because it was open, it was accepting, and has an incredible broad range of programs that we do enjoy, we do support, and it's where the various elements of the community talk to each other, sound out ideas with each other, and we grow together. And I always found that very refreshing. Well, thank you so much. Those are heartwarming words. And I wondered if you'd like to be my next director of marketing and communications. Because <laughs> that's the best, most ringing endorsement I could ever imagine anyone saying. Join me in thanking Gary Tintero for coming. Today.